So welcome back to lecture 31. Today we're going to begin talking about the nitrogen cycle. But before we do, I just want to pick up and finish one last uh, topic about the carbon cycle uh, that we began talking about last time. So last time we ended our lecture talking about how warming in the tundra, where we have all those uh, frozen soils uh, in the permafrost, uh, how that may impact decomposition. So one reason that this issue is so important is that when the permafrost starts to thaw, all that dead organic matter that hadn't been decomposed in the past uh, because it got frozen, that is now available again to all the microbial decomposers living in the tundra. And that's just a ton of food. So what is expected to happen then is as those as all that food becomes available, those microbes uh, are gonna eat away at that dead organic matter and during the process of respiration, uh, most of that carbon locked away in that dead organic matter gets released as CO2 back to the atmosphere. So this brings us to the issue of feedbacks between climate and the carbon cycle. Feedbacks are very common in biological systems and they're also very important and common uh, among factors that influence climate. Now, feedbacks can be either positive or negative. So we'll start off with negative feedbacks. So a negative feedback is when you have a perturbation to a system that leads to a change uh, in that, that system that ends up reducing the size of the initial perturbation. So what does that mean? Well, let's take uh, climate as an example in the tundra. Um, we are currently increasing uh, the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. And as CO2 is a greenhouse gas, this uh, is increasing the temperature of the planet, uh, including in systems like the tundra. Now, the question is, in terms of a negative feedback, if we're thinking about the tundra, what process uh, could be influenced by either increased CO2 or increased temperature that would tend to uh, lead to a negative feedback, meaning that it would tend to lead to a reduction in atmospheric CO2 and temperature? So take a minute and think about what process uh, that we've talked about in the when we've talked about the carbon cycle, that could lead to just such a negative feedback. Increasing atmospheric CO2 levels uh, may have a positive effect on photosynthesis, which remember is a major flux in the carbon cycle of the plants living in the tundra. Uh, we think that many plants currently might be at least partially limited by CO2 uh, levels. And so with an increase in atmospheric CO2, uh, we might expect to see those plants increase their rates of photosynthesis. And when they do that, um, when they do photosynthesis, that means they're sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere and using that CO2 to build sugars and it will get uh, locked away in the vegetation. So increased atmospheric CO2 could lead to higher photosynthesis and plant growth, which of course uh, we refer to as net primary productivity. So such an increase in net primary productivity uh, leads to more CO2 being sucked out of the atmosphere, and that is going to tend to have a negative impact then on atmospheric CO2. And so that initial increase in atmosphere, atmospheric CO2 is gonna to tend to be reduced um, 
more than it would otherwise if those plants weren't responding in the way that they were. That's one uh, potential way that we can see a negative feedback in the tundra uh, when it comes to climate and the carbon cycle. Now, another type of negative feedback that's pos possible is that, of course, atmospheric CO2 leads to an increase in temperature. And we've already discussed how tundras, uh, the tundra is a very temperature limited system. So an increase in temperature could uh, greatly impact the rates of photosynthesis and growth in, in the system. Again, which is going to tend to cause more CO2 to get sucked up by the plants living there. And that also is gonna to tend to reduce atmospheric CO2 levels, which will also reduce then the temperature. So that initial increase in temperature is again, partially reduced uh, because of this negative feedback uh, by the plants in response to that increasing temperature. And one important thing to note here in both of these cases is when we have these negative feedbacks between the ecosystem and climate, what we see is that this negative feedback uh, tends to mitigate the effects of fossil fuel burning on the climate. Okay, so it tends to mitigate those effects, meaning that initial increase in temperature or and that initial increase in atmospheric CO2 aren't as great as they might have been if this negative feedback with the vegetation wasn't taking place. Uh, so climate, it still gets warmer, the atmospheric levels still go up in response to burning fossil fuels, but just not as much. So this is good for us. These negative feedbacks between uh, ecosystems and climate are helpful because we don't want the climate to change that much uh, because of course we're not changing the climate on purpose. However, negative feedbacks are not the only feedback uh, with climate that we expect to see in the tundra. And instead of negative feedbacks, we also have positive feedbacks, which occur when a perturbation of a system leads to a change that ends up amplifying that initial perturbation. So it actually makes the size of that initial perturbation even greater. Now, in the tundra, there is troub troublingly uh, the possibility of quite a large positive feedback uh, to occur with climate change as a result of changes in decomposition. So again, we start off with having an increase in atmospheric CO2, which has a positive impact on the temperature. But as we have discussed in our lectures on decomposition rates, one of the things that influences decomposition is temperature. And so we expect t increased temperature to have a positive effect on decomposition. But even more importantly, as temperature increases and all this dead organic material that's frozen away in the permafrost thaws, uh, there is now way more food available uh, for those decomposers to eat. And that particularly is going to lead to increased decomposition rates uh, and microbial respiration that will lead to a huge f and increased flux of CO2 back into the atmosphere as they eat away at these huge pools of organic carbon that are currently locked away. So increasing temperature is expected to have a very big impact on decomposition in the tundra uh, and as a result of microbial respiration, releasing CO2 into the atmosphere, we expect to see a positive 
effect on the release of CO2, thus leading to a further increase in atmospheric CO2 and a further increase in temperature. So unlike those negative feedbacks, when we have positive feedbacks between climate and an ecosystem, this tends to exacerbate or make worse the effects of fossil fuel burning on the climate. Now, of course, these negative and positive feedbacks aren't just occurring separately, and it's not either or. In fact, we expect to see them both operating at the same time. Uh, but this leads to the question of if both are occurring, which effect will be larger? So we might expect to see this negative feedback because of the vegetation, but at the same time, we expect this positive feedback because of decomposition, which one is going to win out? If the NEP becomes negative and they're releasing more carbon than they're sucking out of the atmosphere. So which of these two feedbacks uh, are going to sort of win out? And the answer to this is currently unclear, but people think that the Arctic and the tundra, uh, maybe 10 years or more ago, uh, that a lot of it probably had an NEP of about zero. So the carbon coming in through NPP was about equal to the carbon going out due to respiration by heterotrophs, mainly the decomposers. So this is our, our H. Um, and because these were in balance, we end up with a net ecosystem productivity or an NEP of zero. Now, what was thought was that as these systems warm and you move maybe 15 years into the future from 10, about 10 years ago, uh, we might, we're gonna see changes. So we're gonna see the plants growing faster. So NPP increases, there's more CO2 being pulled out of the atmosphere, but at the same time, more of this old carbon that was locked away in those soils um, gets respired as well. But it was thought that initially what we will see is that change in NPP the increase in NPP would be greater than the increase in decomposition and heterotrophic respiration. And thus, at least temporarily, we expect the, the, uh, the tundra to act as a carbon sink, meaning more carbon coming in than going out. So it would have an NEP of greater than one. However, over time, the plants still grow faster, they still photosynthesize more, but as temperature increase even more, we expect that the increase in NPP would no longer be larger than the increase in decomposition. That would th now be, be greater. And this would change the tundra from a carbon sink to a carbon source, a source of carbon to the atmosphere, uh, meaning that it has an NEP of less than one. So this is what uh, maybe 10 years ago was predicted to happen 35 years uh, from that time period. But unfortunately, it seems like we may have been overly optimistic about this time frame and how long it would take for the Arctic uh, to become a net source of carbon uh, to the atmosphere. And 
more recent data and some modeling suggests that many parts of the Arctic may already be acting as carbon sources to the atmosphere. And this is in part due to the fact that we think we have been underestimating the amount of decomposition that occurs in the winter under the snow when things aren't quite frozen. This suggests that Perhaps we were right about this trajectory, um, but it's just we're a little bit further in that trajectory than we had hoped.